morning, everybody. Happy Monday. Um, we are here um, starting chapter seven of The Hunger Games. We know that we left Gita and Katniss off um, as they prepare for the training um, that happens before they go into The Hunger Games. Chapter seven. My summers are filled with disturbing dreams. The face of the red-headed girl intertwines with gory images from earlier Hunger Games, with my mother withdrawn and unreachable, with Prim emaciated and terrified. I bolt up screaming for my father to run as the mine explodes into a million deadly bits of light. Dawn is breaking through the windows. The capital has a misty, haunted air. My head aches, and I must have bitten into the side of my cheek in the night. My tongue probes the, the ragged flesh, and I taste blood. Slowly, I drag myself out of bed into the shower. I arbitrarily punch my buttons on the control board, end up hopping from foot to foot as alternating jets of icy cold and steaming hot water assault me. Then I'm dil deluged in a lemony foam that I have to scrape off with a heavy bristled brush. Oh well, at least my blood is flowing. When, I dry when I'm dried and moisturized with lotion, I find an outfit has been left for me in the front of the closet. Tight black pants, a long-sleeved burgundy tunic, and leather shoes. I put my hair on the single braid down my back. This is the first time since the morning of the reaping that I reassemble myself. No fancy hair and clothes, no flaming capes, just me. Looking like I could be headed for the woods. It calms me. Haymitch hey, didn't give us an exact time to meet for breakfast, and no one has contacted me this morning. But I'm hungry, so I head down to the dining room, hoping there will be, will be food. I'm not disappointed. While the table is empty, a long board off to the side has been laid with at least 20 dishes. A young man, an Avox, stands at attention by the spread. When I ask if I can serve myself, he nods assent. I load a plate with eggs, sausage, butter cakes covered in thick orange preserves, slices of pale purple melon. As I gorge myself, I watch the sun rise over the capital. I have a second plate of hot grain smothered in beef stew. Finally, I fill a plate with rolls and sit at the table, breaking off bits and dipping them in hot chocolate the way Peta did on the train. My mind wanders to my mother and Prim. They must be up. My mother getting their breakfast of mush, Prim milking her goat before school. Just two mornings ago, I was home. Can that be right? Yes, just two. And now how empty the house feels, even from a distance. What did they do last night about my fiery debut at the games? Did it give them hope or simply add to their terror when they saw the reality of 24 tributes circled together, knowing only one could live? Hey, Mitch and Peta came, come in, bid me good morning, fill their plates. It makes me irritated that Peta is wearing exactly the same outfit I am. I need to say something to Sinna. This twins act is going to blow up in our faces once the games begin. Surely they must know this. Then I remember Hamish telling me to do exactly what the stylists tell me to do. If it has anyone but, S if it was anyone but Sinna, I might be tempted to ignore him. But after last night's triumph, I don't have a lot of room to criticize his choices. I'm nervous about the training. There will be three days in which all the tributes practice together. On the last afternoon, we'll each get a chance to perform in private before the game makers. The thought of, of meeting the other tributes face to face makes me queasy. I turn the roll I have just taken from the basket over and over in my hands, but my appetite is gone. When Hamish has finished several platters of stew, he pushes back his plate with a sigh. He takes a, flash, a flask from his pocket and takes a long pull on it, and he leans his elbows on the table. So let's get down to business. Training. First off. If you like, I'll coach you separately. Decide now. Why would you coach us separately, I ask. Say if you had a, a secret skill you might not want the other to know about, says Hamish. I exchange a look with Peta. I don't have any secret skills, he says, and I already know what yours is, right? I mean, I've eaten enough of your animals. I never thought about Peta eating the squirrels I shot. Somehow I always pictured the baker quietly going off and frying them up for himself. Not out of greed, but because town families usually eat expensive butcher meat, beef and chicken and horse. You can coach us together, I, I tell Hamish. Peta nods. All right, so give me some idea of, of what you can do, says Hamish. I can't do anything, says Peta, unless you count baking bread. 
I'm sorry, I don't, Katniss. I already know you're handy with a knife, says Hamish. Not really, but I can hunt, I say, with a bow and arrow. And you're good? asks Hamish. I have to think about it. I've been putting food on the table for four years. That's no small task. I'm not as good as my father was, but he'd have more practice. I've better aim than Gale, but I'm not but I've had more practice. He's a genius with traps and snares. I'm all right, I say. She's excellent, says Peta. My father buys her squirrels. He always comments on how the arrow never pierces the body. She hits everything, everyone in the eye. It's the same with the rabbit she sells, the butcher. She can even bring down a deer. This assessment of my skills from Peta takes me totally by surprise. First, that he, he ever noticed. Second, that he's talking me up. What are you doing? I ask him suspiciously. What are you doing? If he's going to help you, he, he has to know what you're capable of. Don't underrate yourself, says Peta. I don't know why, but this rubbed me the wrong way. What about you? I've seen you in the market. You can lift hundred pound bags of flour, I snap at him. Tell him that. That's not nothing. Yes, and I'm sure the arena will be full of bags of flour for me to chuck at people. It's not like being able to use a weapon. You know it isn't, he shoots back. He can wrestle, I tell Hamish. He came in second in our school competition last year, only after his brother. What was that? What use is that? I, 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 how many times have you seen someone wrestle someone to death, says Peta in disgust. There's always hand-to-hand -hand combat. All you need to do is come up with a knife and you'll at least stand a chance. If I get jumped, I'm dead. I can hear my voice rising in anger. But you won't. You'll be living up in some tree eating raw squirrel and picking off people with arrows. You know what my mother said to me when she came to say goodbye, as if to cheer me up? She says maybe District 12 will finally have a winner. Then I realized she didn't mean me, she meant you, burst out Peta. Oh, she meant you, I say with a wave of dismissal. She said she's a survivor, that one. She is, says Peta. That pulls me up short. Did his mother really say that about me? Did she rate me over her son? I see the pain in Peta's eyes and know he isn't lying. Suddenly I'm behind the bakery and I can feel the chill of the rain running down my back and the hollowness in my belly. I sound 11 years old when I speak, but only because someone helped me. Peta's eyes flicker down to the roll in, in my hands, and I know he remembers that day too, but he just shrugs. People will help you in the arena. They'll be tripping over each other to sponsor you. No more than you, I say. Peter rolls his eyes at Hamish. She has no idea the effect she can have. He runs his fingernail along the wood grain on the table, refusing to look at me. What on earth does he mean? People help me. When we were dying of starvation, no one helped me. No one except Peter. Once I had something to barter with, things changed. I'm a tough trader, or am I? What effect do I have? That I'm weak and needy? Is he suggesting I got good deals because people pitied me? I try to think of this as true. Perhaps some of the merchants were a little generous in their trades, but I always attributed that to their long-standing relationship with my father. Besides, my game is first class. No one pitied me. I glower at the roll. Sure, he meant to insult me. After about a minute of this, Hamish says, Well, then. Well, well, well. Katniss, there's no guarantee there'll be bows and arrows in the arena, but during your private session with the game makers, show them what you can do. Until then, stay clear of archery. Are you are you any good at trapping? I know a few b basic snars, I mutter. That may be significant in terms of food, says Hamish. And Peta, she's right. Never underestimate strength in the arena. Very often, physical power tilts the advantage to a player. In the training center, they will have weights but don't reveal how much you can lift in front of the other tributes. The plan's the same for both of you. You go to group training, spend time trying to learn something you don't know, throw a spear, swing a mace, try to tie a decent knot, show something that you're, you're best at, don't save something, save showing what you're best at until your private sessions. Are we clear? Says Hamish. Peta and I nod. One last thing. In public, I want you by, by each other's side every minute, says Hamish. We both start to object, but Hamish slams his hand on the table. Every minute. It's not open for discussion. You agreed to do as I said. 
You will be together. You will appear amiable to each other. Now get out. Meet Effie at the elevator at 10 for training. I bite my lip and stalk back to my room, making sure Peta can hear the door slam. I sit on the bed, hating Hamish, hating Peta, hating myself for mentioning the day long ago in the rain. It's such a joke. Peta and I going along pretending to be friends, talking up each other's strengths, insisting the other take credit for their abilities. Because in fact, at some point, we're going to have to knock it off and accept we're bitter adversaries. Which I'd be prepared to do right now if it wasn't for Hamish's stupid instruction that we stick together in training. It's my own fault, I guess, for telling him he didn't have to coach us separately. But that didn't mean I wanted to do everything with Peta, who, by the way, clearly doesn't want to be partnering up with me, either. I hear Peta's voice in my head. She has no idea the effect she can have. Obviously meant to demean me, right? But a tiny part of me wonders if this was a compliment. That he meant it I was appealing in some way. It's weird how much he's noticed me. Like the attention he's paid to my hunting. And apparently I have not been as oblivious to him as I imagined either. The flower. The wrestling. I've kept track of the boy who, with the bread. It's almost ten. I clean my teeth and smooth back my hair again. Anger tempor temporarily blocked out of my nervousness. Blocked out by my nervousness about meeting the other tributes. But now I can find my anxiety rising again. By the time I meet Effie and Peta at the elevator, I catch myself biting my nails. I stop at once. The actual training rooms are below ground level of our building. With these elevators, the ride is less than a minute. The doors open into enormous gymnasiums filled with various weapons and obstacle courses. Although it's not yet ten, we're the last ones to arrive. The other tributes are gathered in a tense circle. They each have a cloth square with, with their district number on it pinned to their shirts. While someone pins the number 12 on my back, I do a quick assessment. Pita and I, the only two dressed alike. As we join the circle, the head trainer, a tall athletic woman named Attila, steps up and begins to explain the training schedule. Experts in each skill will remain at their stations. We will be free to travel from area to area as we choose. Per our mentor's instructions, some of the stations teach survivor skills, others fighting techniques. We are forbidden to engage in any combative exercise with other tribute, with another tribute. There are assistants on hand if we want to practice with a partner. But Attila begins to read down the list of the skill stations. My eyes can't help flinting around to the other tributes. It's the first time we've been assembled on level ground in simple clothes. My heart sinks. Almost all of the boys and at least half of the girls are bigger than I am, even though many of the, the tributes have never been fed properly. You can see it in their bones, their skin, their hollow look in their eyes. I may be smaller naturally, but overall my family's resourcefulness has given me an edge in that area. I stand straight, and while I'm thin, I'm strong. The meat and plants from the woods combined with the ex exertion it took to get them have given me a healthier body than most of those I see around me. The exceptions are the kids from the wealthier districts, the vol volunteers, the ones who have been fed and trained throughout their lives for this moment. The tributes from one, two, and four traditionally have this look about them. It's technically against the rules to train tributes before they reach the capital, but it happens every year. In District 12, we call them the career, career tributes, or just the careers. In, and like as not, the winner will be one of them. The slight advantage I held coming into the training center, my fiery, my fiery entrance last night, seems to vanish in the presence of my competition. The other tributes were jealous of us, but not because we were amazing, because our stylists were. Now I see nothing but contempt in the glances of the career tributes. Each must have 50 to 100 pounds on me. They project arrogance and brutality. When Atala releases us, they head straight for the de deadliest looking weapons in the gym and handle them with ease. I'm thinking that it's lucky I'm a fast runner when Peta nudges my arm and I jump. He is still beside me, per Hamish's instructions. His expression is sober. Where would you like to start? I look around at the career tributes who are showing off, clearly trying to intimidate the field. Then at the others, the un underfed, the incompetent, shakily having their first lessons with a knife or an axe. Suppose we tie some knots, I say. Right you are, says Peta. We cross to an empty station where the trainer seems pleased to have students. 
you get the feeling that the knot tying class is not the Hunger Games hotspot. When he realizes I know something about snares, he shows us a simple, a simple, excellent trap that will leave a human competitor dangling from a leg from a tree. We concentrate on this one skill for an hour until both of us have mastered it. Then we move on to camouflage. Peta genuinely seems to enjoy the station, swirling a combination of mud and clay and berry juices around on his pale skin, weaving disguises from vines and leaves. The trainer who runs the camouflage station is full of enthusiasm as, as he works. I do the cakes, he admits to me. The cakes, I ask. I've been preoccupied with watching the boy from District 2 send a spear through a dummy's heart from 15 yards. What cakes? At home, the iced ones from the bakery, he says. He means the ones that display in the windows, fancy cakes with flowers and pretty things painted, and frosting. They're for birthdays and New Year's parties. When we're in the square, Prim always drags me over to admire them, although we'd never be able to afford one. There's little enough beauty in District 12, though, so I can hardly deny her of this. I look more critically at the design on Peta's arm. The alternating pattern of light and dark suggests sunlight falling through the leaves on the, in the woods. I wonder how he knows this, since I doubt he's ever been beyond the, the fence. Has he been able to pick, up, pick this up from just the, the scraggly old apple tree in his backyard? Somehow the whole thing, his skill, those inaccessible cakes, the praise of the camouflage expert annoys me. It's lovely. If only you could frost someone to death, I say. Don't be so superior. You can never tell what you'll find in the arena. Say it's actually a gigantic cake, begins Peta. Say we move on, I break in. So the next three days pass, with Peta and me going quietly from station to station. We do pick up some valuable skills from starting fires to knife throwing to making shelter. Despite Hamish's order to appear mediocre, Peta excels in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and I sweep the edible plants test without blinking an eye. We steer clear of archery and weightlifting, though, wanting to, have to save those for our private sessions. The game makers appeared early on the first day, twenty or so men and women dressed in deep purple robes. They sit in the elevated stands that surround the gymnasium, sometimes wandering, wandering about to watch us, jotting down notes, other times eating at the endless bouquet, endless banquet that has been set for them, ignoring the lot for us. Sorry, the trash is here and I thought we may have forgotten to put it out. Um, all right, where was I? The game makers appeared early on the first day, 20 or so men and women dressed in deep purple robes. They sit in the elevated stands that surround the gymnasium, sometimes wandering, wandering about to watch us, jotting down notes, other times eating at the endless boat banquet that has been set up for them, ignoring the lot of us. But they do seem to be keeping their eyes on District 12 tributes. Several times I've, I've looked up to find one fixated on me. They consult with the trainers during our meals as well. We see them all gathered together when we come back. Breakfast and dinner are served on our floor, but at lunch the 24 of us eat in a dining room off the gymnasium. Food is arranged on carts around the room, and you serve yourself. The career tributes tend to gather rowdily around one table, as if to prove their superiority, and they have no fear of one another and consider the rest of us beneath notice. Most of the other tributes sit alone, like lost sheep. No one says a word to us. Peter and I eat together, and since Hamish keeps dogging us about it, try to keep a friendly conversation during the meals. It's not easy to find a topic. Talking of home is painful. Talking of the present unbearable. One day, Peter empties our, our bread basket and points out how they have been careful to include types from the districts along with the refined bread of the capital. The fish-shaped loaf tinted green with the seaweed from District 4. The crescent moon roll dotted with seeds from District 11. Somehow, although it made, it's made from the same stuff, it looks a lot more appetizing than the ugly drop biscuits that are the standard fare at home. And there you have it, says Peta, scooping the bread back into the basket. You certainly know a lot, I say. Only about bread, he says. Okay. Now laugh as, as if I've said something funny. We both give a, a somewhat convincing laugh and ignore the stares from around the room. All right. 
Well, keep smiling pleasantly and you talk, says PETA. It's wearing on us both out. Hamish's direction is to be friendly. Because ever since I slammed my door, there's been a chill in the air between us. But we have our orders. Did I ever tell you about the time I was chased by a bear? I ask. No, but it sounds fascinating, says PETA. I try and animate my face as I recall the event. A true story in which I'd foolishly challenged a black bear over the rights to a beehive. PETA laughs and asks questions right on cue. He's much better at this than I am. On the second day, while we're talking at taking a shot at spear throwing, he whispers to me, I think we have a shadow. I throw my spear, which I'm not too bad at actually, if I don't have to throw too far, and I see the little girl from District 11 standing back a bit, watching us. She's the 12 year old, the one who reminded me so of prim in stature. Up close, she looks about 10. She has bright dark eyes and satiny brown skin and stands tilted up on her toes with arms slightly extended to her sides, as if ready to take wing at the slightest sound. It's impossible not to think of a bird. I pick up another spear while Peter throws. I think her name's Rue, he says softly. I bite my lip. Rue is a small yellow flower that grows in the meadow. Rue, primrose. Neither of them could tip the scale at seventy pounds soaking wet. What can we do about it? I ask him more harshly than I intended. Nothing to do, he says back, just making conversation. Now that I know she's there, it's hard to ignore the child. She slips up and joins us in different stations. Like me, she's clever with plants, climbs swiftly, and has good aim. She can hunt, hit the target every time with a, a slingshot. But what is a slingshot against a 220-pound male with a sword? Back on the District 12 floor, Hamish and Effie grill us throughout breakfast and dinner about every moment of the day. What we did, who watched us, how the other tribute size up. Cinna and Portia aren't around, so there's no one to add any sanity to the meals. Not that Hamish and Effie are fighting anymore. Instead, they seem to be of one mind, determined to whip us into shape, full of endless direction about what we should do and not do in training. Peta is more patient, but I, I become fed up and surly. When we finally escape to bed on the second night, Peter mumbles, Someone ought to get Hamish a drink. I make a sound that is somewhere between a snort and a laugh, then catch myself. It's messing with my mind too much, trying to keep straight when, when we're supposedly friends and when we're not. At least when we get into the arena, I'll know where we stand. Don't. Don't. Let's pretend when there's no one around. All right, Katniss, he says tiredly. After that, we only talk in front of people. On the third day of training, they start to call us out of lunch for our private sessions with the game makers. District by district, first the boy, then the girl tribute. As usual, District 12 is slated to go last. We linger in the dining room, unsure where else to go. No one comes back once they have left. As the room empties, the pressures, pressure to appear friendly lightens. By the time they call Rue, we are left alone. We sit in silence until, um, until they summon Peta. He rises. Remember what Hamish said about using, a, being sure to throw the weights. The words come out of my mouth without permission. Thanks, I will, he says. You? Shoot straight. I nod. I don't know why I say, said something at all. Although, if I'm going to lose, I'd rather Peta win than the others. Better for our district, for my mother and Prim. After about fifteen minutes, they call my name. I smooth my hair, set my shoulders back, and walk into the gymnasium. Instantly, I know I'm in trouble. They've been here too long, the game makers. Sat through 23 other demonstrations. Had to, had too much wine, most of them. Want more than anything to go home. There's nothing I can do but continue with the plan. I walk to the archery station. Oh, the weapons. Have been itching to get my hands on them for days. Bows made of wood and plastic and metal and materials I can't even name. Arrows with feathers cut in flawless uniform lines. I choose a bow, string it, and sling and sling the matchmaking quiver of arrows over my shoulder. There's a shooting range, but it's much too limited. Standard bullseye with human sil silhouettes. I walk to the center of the gymnasium and pick up, pick my first target, the dummy used for knife practice. Even as I pull back on the bow, I know something is wrong. The string's tighter than the one I used at home. The arrow's more rigid. I miss the dummy by a couple of inches and lose what little attention I had. In commanding. 
For a moment I am humiliated. Then I head back to the bullseye. I shoot again and again until I feel I get the feel of this new weapon. Back in the center of the gymnasium, I take my initial position and skewer the dummy right through the heart. Then I sever the rope that holds the sandbag for boxing. The bag splits open and it slams to the ground. Without pausing, I shoulder roll forward, come up on one knee, and send an arrow into one of the hanging lights high above the gymnasium floor. I sh a shower of sparks burst from the fixture. It's excellent shooting. I turn to the game makers. A few are nodding approval, but the majority of them are fixated on a roast pig that has just arrived at their banquet table. Suddenly, I'm furious that with my life on the line, they don't even have the decency to pay attention to me, that I'm being upstaged by a dead pig. My heart starts to pound. I can feel my face burning. Without thinking, I pull an arrow from my quiver and send it straight at the game maker's table. I hear shouts of alarm as people stumble back. The arrow skewers the apple in the pig's mouth and pins it to the wall behind it. Everyone stares at me in disbelief. Thank you for your consideration, I say. Then I give a slight bow and walk straight toward the exit without being dismissed. All right, that is the end of chapter seven. That was a pretty long chapter, um, but we're getting kind of an idea of some of the new skills that Peta and Katniss are learning. And we can also see that Katniss has had a chance to make quite the impression on the game makers. Um, all right, I'm looking forward to a great day. I'll see you guys later. Bye.